Thanks. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. I didn't expect so many people to turn up. Um, my name's Alan Day. I've been involved in the Known Project since about uh, 2009. Um, I'm mostly known for my work on design, but I've also done marketing work, and I've been on the board of directors for the past couple of years. Um, now, this talk is something that I've been kind of thinking about for a, a little while, and since it was Gnome's 20th anniversary this year, it seemed like an appropriate talk to give at this year's Guardec. The talk is primarily about ideas, uh, so it's not a technological talk. Um, it's about our principles and our values. Um, because it seems to me that it's these things more than anything else that define what the GNOME project is, what we're about. You know, you could take every line of code we've ever written and delete it tomorrow and change it with something else. And if we still hung on to our values and our beliefs and our goals and our aspirations, we would still be the GNOME project. Like, every one of us in this room could stop contributing to GNOME tomorrow. We could walk away and be replaced by a whole new set of people. But if those people carried on believing in the same things that we believe in, if they had the same aspirations and values, then it would still be the GNOME project. So values, principles, ideas, they are what makes this project what it is. And I think we ought to talk about that more. And that's why I wanted to give this talk. Our principles are what makes us unique. They're what makes us different from other software projects, whether they're um, proprietary ones or open source projects. Um, they define what is important about GNOME, and in doing so, they, they tell us why we matter. And it's really important that, as a project, we have a sense of why we matter. Because it's only when we have that self-understanding that we can then go out into the world and tell other people why we matter. And that's, you know, you know, a really important part of what I think GNOME should be about. There's another reason for wanting to talk about principles and ideas and values. And that's that GNOME is going to be 20 years old this year. <laughs> Which is, you know, an amazing accomplishment in itself. But it also kind of brings with it inherent challenges. You know, 20 years is a long time for, in software. And people come and people go and you know, the community is constantly reinvigorating itself, which is fantastic. But it also brings with it the challenge of you can lose your kind of collective history if you're not continually kind of talking about it, thinking about it, explaining it to others. And as we kind of look forward and think about the next generations of known contributors that are coming in, I think it's really important that we think about what kind of values and principles we want to communicate to them, what, how we want to tell them what GNOME is about. And so that's the other reason I wanted to, to give this talk, to try and come up with some resources, possibly, that we could use as a part of that effort. So in what remains of this talk, I'm going to very quickly go through what I think are the, the main principles behind the GNOME project. And it's, you know, it's a personal list. Other people would probably come up with a different list, but that's good, and that's healthy, and that's the kind of conversation that I think we ought to be having. Um, but I have given this quite a lot of thought, and I've, I've done research over the years, and um, I'm going to kind of cite some evidence and some examples and a little bit of history just to kind of illustrate maybe where we're coming from and perhaps where we're going in the future. Okay. 
So, principle number one, principle number one is we are principled. Like, it's fairly meta. It might be obvious, but it's worth saying, you know, the GNOME project is a place where people operate according to values and principles. And, you know, this is something that really struck me when I first got involved in this project. You know, these people went in the business of doing things because they were easy or it was the most efficient way to do things. And they weren't doing something just for the sake of it. You know, they, they had some really important aspirations and they wanted to do it the right way. You know, it wasn't about kind of quick hacks or like, you know, kind of making things as quickly and as possible. They had standards. They had a kind of self-understanding of what they were about. And, um, you know, this kind of principled attitude, it can, it can get us in trouble sometimes. You know, it, it causes tension. Like, we will often kind of go out on a limb. We will, like push in difficult directions, we will go against the flow sometimes. And that can cause tension and, you know, some people online will complain about that. But I think it's absolutely vital to who we are because if whenever there was a pressure to go one way or another, we just went with the flow, then you would end very quickly end up directionless. Um, you know, and that's a very easy thing for an open source project to become, I think. You know, we don't always get it right. You know, sometimes we get things wrong, but we stick to our guns and we always try and make decisions with a kind of deeper understanding of the problem. I, I think that's really important. So we are principled, we operate according to principles. We believe in freedom. This is principle number two. I mean, obvious point, uh, the GNOME project was born out of a commitment to software freedom. There's a small group of people who believed that there ought to be a free software desktop. And that's what they set out to create. You know, there are other desktops out there, but they wanted a free one. Um, and, you know, as we've grown, you know, lots of people have come into the project and Lots of us have slightly different ideas about what software freedom means or uh, the best way to achieve it, but I think we do share a common interest in software freedom. It's something that binds us all together. But I think GNOME is quite special, actually, when it comes to its attitude to software freedom. We are not just any free software project. I think we actually have quite a deep and sophisticated understanding of what it means to be free. And I think that we can um, articulate this more. And I think it's something that does differentiate us from a lot of other projects. Um, because we recognize that software freedom isn't just about code. I think this is a really powerful idea. You know, we're not just in the... Pro in the kind of act of releasing code under a copyleft license. You know, we go much, much further than that. So I think in our practices and, and the way we work as a project, we understand that true software freedom comes from the ability to participate in the production and the maintenance of the software itself. And that has dramatic impact on the way that our project is run. And you see that every day in GNOME. You know, you see it in the um, Newcomers Project. You see it in uh, Outreach as well, I think. Every step of the way, we try to be welcoming. We try to be open. We try to be transparent. We, we don't always succeed, but that is the goal. That is the principle that we hold ourselves to. And that's a really radical idea. It goes far beyond the kind of standard understanding of free software. You know, it's a very egalitarian, inclusive understanding of freedom. That's really radical, it's really powerful. So I think we ought to be talking about that. We ought to be kind of um, championing that approach. We ought to be saying this is what we stand for. Okay, so um, I'd like to see a show of hands now. Who here has read the Gnome Foundation Charter? 
kind of a, oh my, oh, there's some sh shame, shame, board members, board members. <laughs> it's not, I'm not entirely surprised. But actually, this is a very principled document with some very kind of radical ideas. This is what it says. In almost every sense of the word, GNOME is an open project. This is one of our greatest strengths, has always been and should be the bale fire by which we plot our course into the future. The foundation should not be exclusionary or elitist. Every GNOME contributor, however small his or her contribution, must have the opportunity to participate in determining the direction and actions of the project. I mean, that's, that's really powerful stuff, right? That's like a kind of radical, kind of participatory democracy. And that's like one of, that's our like founding document as a project. It was written in 2000. So I'm, I'm not surprised that not that many of you have read it. I don't think it's that surprising, but it's maybe worth thinking about how we can bring these ideas and principles more to the forefront so that kind of, I could do this talk in a year's time and everyone could put their hand up when they said that, that they've, you know, they've read what GNOME is about. Principle number three, we make inclusive software. This directly follows on from the commitment to freedom, the inclusive nature of the GNOME project in general, but it also relates to the the software that we produce that we put in the hands of users. Um, and this is a really strong part of GNOME's heritage. It's something that we've had a commitment to from very early on in the project's history. Um, and we've seen it in lots of different efforts. We've seen it in the usability project, which is about like, making our software accessible to non-technical users. We've seen it with the accessibility project, with you know this um, like incredibly important idea that people ought to be able to use our software even if they have you know, particular uh, physical or mental disabilities. We see it with our translation teams bringing our software to people who speak different languages. And most recently we've seen it with this new concern with geography, which I think our, you know, our friends at Endless have brought to us and is absolutely kind of in keeping with the traditions of the GNOME project. And that's all about making our software usable to people in different parts of the world who might not have the best hardware, who might not have an internet connection or a reliable internet connection. So our goal is to make something that is truly general purpose, to try and make a desktop that uh, is free and as many people in the world can use as possible. And it, and it kind of drives a, a lot of the, the things that we do as a project, I think. And uh, I'll go into that in a little more detail. Um, but I want to kind of linger on the question of usability very briefly. And this might be a slight indulgence being a designer, but I, I think it's kind of indicative. Now, I want to tell a story. And I call this story Too Many Clocks. And some of you might know what this means. So. A critical point in the GNOME project's history was uh, back in the dark, mysterious GNOME 1 days um, when there was a, a very major event in the history of the GNOME project. Some microsystems did a usability study on what we had then, which was GNOME 1.4. And one of the things that we had back then were applets. Um, in particular, we had clock applets. So if you wanted to add a clock to your panel, you had a choice of clock, another clock, <laughs> after step clock, or the ever popular JCB binary clock. It maybe doesn't come as a huge surprise that this didn't perform very well in the usability tests that were performed. In fact, most of the people that were presented with this laughed. <laughs> they thought it was really funny. Um, there is a serious point, though, here. I, I think, you know, in the early days, you know, GNOME was new, it was young, it was inexperienced. 
There were hackers having a lot of fun. And I'm sure this was a lot of fun. But actually, when you put it in front of real world users, it didn't make sense. And I think when we were presented with these results and when we started thinking about usability, that was a real key point for the project because we started thinking about people other than ourselves. And we realized that we were making software that wasn't just for us. And that can create all kinds of conflict um, with you know, software enthusiasts because software enthusiasts aren't often very good about at thinking about people other than themselves. And we often end up with, in kind of fights and conflicts over this. But it's something to be proud of that, that we take this attitude. Um, who here has read Havoc Pennington's blog post that has that title? Oh, oh it's better, but... Um, I mean, Havoc really kind of took up this cause in a really big way. And his blog post called Free Software UI, I think is one of the most critical documents in the history of the GNOME project. Like if there was an entrance exam to, to join the GNOME Foundation, that would be on it, right? Like, I think, like every, every intern, every new contributor, I think should be sat down and made to re read this thing. Um, because it really, it really encapsulates a lot of the kind of key principles of the project. And um, it's about, a lot of it is about preferences, about options, about configuration, about customization. And this is one of the things that we have constant battles over, but it really kind of represents our thinking as being about inclusivity, thinking about others. And one of the key lessons of that um, documents is that preferences have a cost. And this is something that I think um, is really important, actually, because it's, it speaks to this concern with usability. And it's something that Gnome can be proud of. Um, we have championed this point of view amongst free software for the best part of two decades now. And we, we, you know, we were one of the ones to figure it out first. And we're still fighting those battles today. You know, I still have this conversation to people where they don't understand this. Like, sometimes they're kind of long-term people who have a lot of experience, but this is news to them after all that time. So this is important for us. Anyway, that was my, my usability diversion. And I'm running out of time now, I think. All right, OK. So. Let's move on to principles and ideas again. Principle number four, high quality engineering. This again, something very apparent to me when I first joined GNOME. We have high standards. We expect our software to be well designed. We expect our code to be well written. We don't do hacks, often. <laughs> but even when we do do hacks, we know it's wrong, and we try not to. That's the key. Um, we have a lot of experts, and we consult experts when we, we design our software. And our commitment to engineering quality is reflected in our practices, our day-to-day -day practices. You know, Code review is an important one there, continuous integration. I'd love it if we did more QA testing, but you know, the commitment is there. You know, there are projects out there that will write bad code in order to achieve results quickly. That's not us. We expect our code to be reliable, easily maintained, to be performant, and we make sure we do the job right. We don't just get the job done, we do it right. And again, that can cause conflict. It can be hard. People want their features quickly. They don't care about code quality. They don't care about maintenance issues, but we do. And that's something that we stand up for. Principle number five, 
we care about the stack. Over the years, members of the GNOME project have been uh, responsible for generating all kinds of important pieces of infrastructure, um, vital parts of modern Linux-based operating systems. And that's because we take a holistic view of, of the operating system, of this thing. You know, like, we care about the entire system that we give to users. And in order to do that, we look beyond our own code. We are not parochial. If we see something in someone else's library or system, we go out and we fix it. And we don't work around it in our own code. We find the source of that problem and we address it directly. And that can mean working across boundaries, working with other communities. It can mean writing new pieces of inf infrastructure. It can mean draining swamps. And for a lot of GNOME's history, we've got a very good track record of draining swamps. Again, this is a powerful principle. You know, it's about looking out beyond ourselves. It's about interfacing with the rest of the free software ecosystem. And we continue to do this today. You know, it's a commitment that GNOME has in its day-to-day -day work. You know, we only have to look at things like Flatpak, Pipewire. These are the kind of next generation components that are absolutely critical to our future. Okay. Final principle, principle number six. We take responsibility. This is a really hard one for a lot of people in the free software world. And this is a principle that I learned from uh, John McCann. And a lot of you will uh, know John well. Um, he was you know, a, a powerful advocate for this. And he was the, the lead designer for the GNOME 3 effort. And the very first design document that he wrote for Gnome Shell back in 2009 had a set of principles, and this was principle number one. And I think John had a very good understanding of what this meant, means. It means this holistic view. It means thinking about the user and their experience and thinking beyond ourselves. It means caring about quality. It means caring about all the things that make up the experience other than the software itself. It means caring about documentation, about support, about the ex entire experience as a whole. And it's our problem. It's not someone else's problem. And that is the crux of this issue about options and configuration. Because every time you're adding options and configuration, you're saying, it's your responsibility. You know, it's this classic example. Put something in your XOR conf and it will work. It worked for me. You know, this is not what we do. This is not what we're about. We want it to work for everyone, and it's our job to make sure it works. It's not the user's job. And, you know, this just make it work at attitude is, again, something that absolutely sums up what we do as a project. You know, major pieces of software that we have been responsible for that have precisely this goal in mind. You know, network manager, just make my Wi-Fi work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like Metacity, I just want Windows, I don't care. You know, all of this stuff that, that we've made to make things just work. So that's it, six principles. The, the principles that I think are important to this project I think one of the important things about kind of talking about them, about making them explicit, is that we can start thinking about them and discussing them. And I don't want this to be something that we set in stone, that, that we're just looking to the past and we're continually trying to um, reinforce, although I think some of that is good. But when we talk about it, when we have the evidence that we can look at, when we can kind of elaborate what we mean by each of these ideas, then we can start asking whether they're the right ones, whether we should update them. Maybe these need updating for the next 20 years, and, and what would these principles look like as we go forward as a project? So I hope that this talk will hopefully be the, the start of a kind of conversation as much as anything else. But um, we've got a huge amount to be proud of, but also some really important ideas that I think we can stand up for and kind of um, promote more as, a, as, as an organization. So, 
that's it. Thank you very much. Do we do questions now, or are we out of time? What time? Five minutes. Okay. Uh, any questions? Challenges? There's a mic. Cool. You can do the next one. Oh, you might want to turn it on. Sorry. Uh, sorry? Okay. Hello? Okay. So, um, you mentioned, like, mm, th thinking about the user's experience and, like, holistically thinking about what users care about. But, like, for the last, say, seven years, there hasn't really been a mainstream distribution that shipped, like, core GNOME, except for Fedora. Like, what? <laughs> I mean, come on, like, Ubuntu shipped, like, a super old version, and, like, I mean, wouldn't, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm not mentioning those guys, but, like, I feel like maybe, maybe you sort of, like, I don't know, taking a slightly less principled approach there could have brought GNOME to a much bigger kind of group of people over the last, say, like, decade, but maybe now it's getting better, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, again, that's something to talk about. Like, you know, this principled approach, it has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. And it's important to kind of try and strike that balance. You know, you can't completely forsake any kind of concern about practical issues or efficiency or pragmatics, you know. So there does have to be that balance. But, I, you know, what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, let's have that conversation. You know, like, um, I think it's healthy to have that conversation. Yeah, um, speaking as a mainstream distribution with Sousa, um, who's also shipping GNOME, those last three principles in particular, I think you've summed up the very reasons why we love GNOME so much. You know, that quality engineering, the focusing about the users, the worrying about the stack, it's... Without that, we couldn't rely on GNOME the way we do as the default in both our enterprise distribution and as a major option in the community side. So, yeah, yeah it's, you hit the nail on the head, and I was going to say it privately, but after that, I had to kind of dive in. So, thanks. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Uh, if, I, if I were to propose an addition to your list, um, civility and respectful discourse. Yeah. Uh, this is something that uh, I think GNOME really does very, very well compared to many other projects. Yeah. For those people who have not read the charter or uh, have X blog, do you have links that can that people can find? I, yeah, I mean, if you Google for GNOME Foundation Charter, <laughs> it, it should come up. Um, yeah, I, I'd recommend that people go out and read that. And it's kind of an interesting thought experiment to think about what would happen, what a charter for 2017 would look like. Um, like, refers to, like, CSV or something. You know, like CVS, sorry. Um, it's, a li it's a little outdated in places. <laughs> Um, I think one of the things that uh, stands out to me again and again is this idea of believing in freedom. Um, and I know we embrace it, we promote it. As somebody who does a lot of the non-technical work on the engagement team, things like that, it's sometimes a struggle to find great free software choices that are also easy for newcomers to use. And an yeah. example of this is, for example, 
Where do you host your files if you just want to quickly put up a document that you all share? Um, Nextcloud is available for GNOME Foundation users, but not for like you know random people that want to join the uh, the team. So how can we sort of promote this freedom while still acknowledging the need sometimes for proprietary software and knowing that it's part of our journey towards a wider promotion of freedom software? Um, I've seen sometimes community members, you know again, very much stick to the principle of like freedom software, freedom software, but it, sometimes it discourages people from joining in, like it, contributing to this project. So just as we think about this, I think it's good to also sort of acknowledge or define our stance on how we can leverage proprietary software to get us to where we ultimately want to be. And like this mainstream version that you were talking about, like how do we reach a wider audience, all that kind of stuff. So it's not really a question, it's more so just something for us to think about and um, I don't know, would love your thoughts on tools. Yeah, I mean, I wish I'd kind of, I mean, you make a really good point about freedom, not just being about coding activities. And when I say that, you know, one of the principles that we uphold is that people ought to be able to participate, that doesn't mean just coding. And you know, I think we can be extremely proud of the fact that we have a lot of teams that work along exactly the same principles. Like, you know, I'm incredibly proud that we operate open design in GNOME. We have an open design team. Like, every mock-up is online. All the discussion is in the open. Like, you can probably count the number of projects that do that in the world on one hand. You know, that that is really important. Same with marketing. I mean, marketing. There's always that impulse to have private conversations when you're like working on a publicity splash or something like that. But we don't do that. We, we do that work in the open. And that's really important. On the point about tools, maybe that's another principle. Maybe in addition to caring about the stack, we ought to start saying that we care about the ecosystem. And in the same way that we've kind of gone out and made bits of plumbing that we rely on, we go out and we work with other communities to develop the tools that we need. And may maybe that's the next 20 years, you know. Um, that's like absolutely vital to our success as, as a project. Not just in terms of getting new users, but being able to operate effectively ourselves. Two, two, okay. So um, you mentioned that you take responsibility for the user experience, right? Yeah. This may seem a little odd, but why are you hiding the minimize and maximize button by buttons by default? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. No, that, that's unfair. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I couldn't help myself. Um, yeah, we make tough decisions. <laughs> Maybe they're not always the right decisions, but we make tough decisions. And we do do them for, you know, we have reasons. We always try to have a kind of deeper understanding of the problems. And I think, you know, these principles ought to, if they're working effectively, not be just kind of abstract things, but ideas that are informed by experience. And I think you know the, the Sun Usability Study is a classic example of that because it's a piece of real-world research that then became enshrined in a principle rather than just something that we came up with. If you want to talk about minimize and maximize, <laughs> we're very happy to do that. I'd have to kind of think back. But, um, I just had to throw it out. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> actually having this discussion now, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I don't know who, who the blog post wrote, but it, it's, it's been a, a, a while back where, where they say that, that if a user has to choose between minimizing an application or closing an application, then the user has to do manual management of 
the, the, the applications that are in memory or the applications that are written to disk, and that that's something that the user shouldn't do. And so that's the, the, the concept behind it as, as far as I know. Yeah, there might be some more mundane reasons as well, but I think that's certainly a factor. Okay, thank you very much.